In its seventh year, the Louisiana Book Festival in downtown Baton Rouge presents a bounty of authors and their works. Join us for Louisiana Book Talks as we celebrate our rich literary heritage and visit with exceptional authors at the 2009 Louisiana Book Festival. Lifelong learning through reading is the mission of the Louisiana Book Festival, and thousands of book lovers of all ages are eager to participate. Between the state capitol and the state library, the festival is packed with booths featuring everything from children's storytellers to authors signing their latest works. Inside the state capitol, more than a dozen venues present authors throughout the day, discussing their books and providing a look into the writer's life. John Besh was named one of the top 10 best chefs in America by Food and Wine magazine and won the James Beard Award as Best Chef Southeast in 2006. Louisiana native and world-class chef Besh of New Orleans will discuss his brand new cookbook, My New Orleans, The Cookbook, 200 of my favorite recipes and stories from my hometown. This is um, a real pleasure to be here. I'm a uh, chef, chef. John Besh, and this is my uh, cookbook, my New Orleans, the cookbook. And um, you know, in this day and age, everybody's looking for the value, saying, "What's he doing, coming out with a forty-five dollar cookbook?" And my response is that it's five point two pounds. So if you look at the price per pound, <laughs> it's one of the best book deals out there today. There's a lot of skinny books out there, and this isn't one of them. And so just to give you a little something about uh, myself, one, it was not my idea to put myself on the cover. Did not want that at all, but then the publisher can override anything. That's what the fine print says. I um, started this book about five, six years ago. And um, at that point in time, I thought this would be some chefy book. I wanted to be the best chef on earth and blah, 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 blah. And the fact is, is that the more I got into this and the more I started writing, the more um, I started discovering things not only about myself but also about my New Orleans. And that, uh, for instance, it was going to be called My, Louis my Louisiana. And my Louisiana was going to be about the Louisiana that I know, this Louisiana that I have a relationship with. And we have relationships with all sorts of things, family, friends, lovers, cities, and um, oftentimes they're love-hate relationships, especially with cities and states. And I'm so proud to be a Louisianian and also proud to have been raised in the shadows of New Orleans. And, but I discounted some of that for a long time. I discounted it because I thought, well, you know, I wanted to, you know, I didn't want to just serve red beans and rice. I didn't want to serve just gumbo. I wanted to be something else. I wanted to be original. But how could you be original wearing this kind of this shroud of Louisiana? And so it was something I think, well, part of you know, maturing and growing up. I think we all can relate, and a lot of us, you'll be relating to it soon, um, that you want to get away from home, and you want to leave, and you want to go out, and you want to conquer the world. And I thought I could do that. I thought, number one, I'll just uh, join the French Foreign Legion, but before I could do that, I decided I'd just join the Marines instead, much to my mother's dismay. And so I grew up in Slidell and left, and then, you know, wasn't long before I left that I realized, hmm, I miss Louisiana, and I miss home, and I miss good food, and I miss all these different intangible things that um, we, we all can share in here, but that they, they don't always get in other parts of the country. And then I came back and um, I was attending culinary school in upstate New York and working in New York and thought I'd be a big time chef. And all of a sudden I was invited back into the Marines again and um, sent away to, to, a, um, to a desert, uh, fighting Operation Desert Storm with the first Marine Expeditionary Force. And so when I did that, I'm going through this desert warfare training and we're out there living in holes and um, walking all across, you know, along the um, Kuwaiti-Saudi border, up to the border of Iraq. And I'm walking in every day, digging in, finding a new fighting position, walking to another place. They have these classes called NBC classes, and 
It has nothing to do with television, but it's all about nuclear biological warfare and blah, 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 blah. And I was sitting there one day, and they were saying, now Saddam Hussein's got this bomb. He's got this bomb, and the chances are he's going to drop it on you, and you're going to die of this chemical attack. And it smells just like toasted almonds or brown butter. And I thought, great. Here we go. That just ruins the, you know, that ruins that uh, idyllic um, aroma, that aroma that had awakened my senses many, many times. Actually, every time I would catch some speckled trout and bring them home, that's the way mom would cook them. These trout meniere, and you could smell the brown butter. And if there were some almonds, then the almonds would be in the pan and a little bit of lemon juice and parsley. And you know it, you've all eaten it, and we all love it. And that's why we're here. And so I remember thinking, like, oh, gosh, i got to get back home. And so after that, well, started this, um, I guess, correspondence with my best friend's sister. He was my best friend until I married his sister when I came home. And Jennifer Berrigan. And uh, so started writing, writing. And anybody that knows if you marry a New Orleanian, you can never escape. She will forever bring you back. And that goes for almost... I saw, a, I saw a couple of old friends today. That goes for Louisianian. They will nev you, never, never let you leave. They will always bring you back home. And I don't think I really appreciated that. And so I thought, well, you know, I need to go out and see the world again. And I somehow talked Jennifer into, look, we're going to, she, she, the day she was uh, sworn in to the Louisiana State Bar, we moved to Germany so I could go do this proper apprenticeship at this Relay Chateau up in the mountains of um, Obermunsterthal near Basel, Switzerland. And so I'm working there and we're poor and working, 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 and there's more cows and people that she would constantly remind me. But the more I work there, the more I realized that, hey, you know what, this food is so similar to what I had back home. Who would have ever thought? And it, I kept, the further I would go, the more I would find out about myself and about my city and about my state. And this would continue on and on and on and on until I would open up restaurant August um, years later. And I opened this restaurant thinking, this is it. It's my time to show off. I can show everybody who I am and what a great chef and blah, 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 blah. Well, wouldn't you know that the day that I finally pay off the investors and I pay these guys off and gals, Katrina heads. And then I've been running from the city and I've been pulled back to the city. You know, finally I come back and all of a sudden the city leaves. No, you know, everybody, as you all know, and I'm not going to preach here about um, who, what, where, how, when, and why, but I realized one thing, like, Life is, you know, you just never know. You're, this is so uncertain. And it pained me to think, as I would hear broadcast after broadcast of people pontificating across middle America, that, well, we sh just shouldn't rebuild it. I don't know if we should be rebuild it because, uh, you know, uh, New Orleans doesn't exactly espouse the same beliefs we espouse and all of this. And we all heard that. And it hit me that if I don't act and if I'm not civically minded and aware of what my actions, you know, my actions have huge consequences. And if I um, pull together my team and if we act quickly, we can do something. And we can, um, I thought for sure I'd be bankrupt and no way would I a few years later have uh, six restaurants. But I thought that just like everybody here, that after you do that, you know, after, after hearing about the um, levees being breached and after hearing about the flooding and the the city and the so many thousands that were left in the city that I've got to do something. And we all felt that way. And I mean, God bless, the, the whole country came to our aid. And for that, we're, we in New Orleans are very grateful. But for me, I thought, well, I started reconnecting with all these Marine friends. And these Marine friends would, um, they started marshalling all these resources. My late sister Kathleen at Lafayette started organizing red beans and rice from across the area. And I have friends in Arkansas sending down rice and sending um, diesel fuel and generators and propane tanks and crawfish pots and the whole nine yards. So we started setting up little, um, for lack of a better term, little soup kitchens around the city and around different parts of the metro area. And so we started cooking and feeding people. I'll never forget the first person that I fed, um, this is out of a flat, 
bottom boat, just a little flat boat, 14 foot flat boat with a 25 horsepower out, out forward motor on the back. And we've got a big igloo ice chest full of red beans and rice. And we're just scooping them up, serving them, scooping it up, serving them. The first person I serve looks at the red beans and says, how'd you make this? And I said, well, I'm thinking, what do you care? Like, you're hungry, you lost everything, eat. I'm thinking, look, you know, God gave me this one gift. He gave me the gift that I can, I can cook, I can make food taste good, and uh, I can get out there and feed people and make people happy. And he looks at me and he says, well, this isn't how my mama's red beans look. My mama's red beans have this and blah, 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 blah. And starts telling me about pickle meat. And how can you have red beans without pickle meat? And if you don't have pickle meat, you better at least have a ham hock. And your red beans don't have either one. I thought, well, the reason why I picked red beans and rice is that it sustained our people for centuries. And that you don't need refrigeration. And surely, you know, it's easy, to, easy enough to cook a bean and to cook rice and you can mix it together and it's sustainable. You've got your carbs and you got your protein, all the good stuff that we need to live. He didn't see it that way. And then it hit me. New Orleans is going to be okay. And this is that this quirky city espouses things that maybe the rest of the country doesn't espouse, but they're good things. We value people. And unfortunately, as it may seem, most of us don't know anybody that was ever transferred to New Orleans. You, you're committed to the city. It's like this, it's this relationship. It's a type of love and that you have to commit yourself at times. Even when you don't want to, you have to commit yourself into loving the city. And at that point, it hit me, this overwhelming sense of stewardship, that to be a chef in New Orleans is much greater than being a chef anywhere else in the country because we have, we're stewards of a much greater tradition. We're stewards of this beautiful tradition that's been passed down. And how did that tradition begin? Well, it began because people, quirky people, years ago decided to settle here, and a lot of them were conned into settling down in New Orleans in such a way that um, you know, we, we gathered here only for people, only for family. There's no other reason. And there's no other reason for us to resettle New Orleans after such a disaster other than people and other than um, enjoying those good times, enjoying that, the family traditions, the supper tables on Sundays and the um, kitchen tables during the week. There's something really magical and special about that that I don't think I fully grasped as a chef until now. And then, um, so I'm working on this book. And the book started really taking a different shape. It started taking a shape, you know, focused less on me and more about um, the state. And then my vision of the state was really skewed because when you grow up with an eyesight of New Orleans, whether you like it or not, that Creole culture has a way of permeating um, your thoughts and your, you know, your different values and the way you cook. And let's take gumbo. Everybody, who's from Louisiana here? Can I see a... And who's from West Louisiana? Anybody? Come on, I know they read back there in West Louisiana. Well, if you're from West Louisiana, your gumbo is like totally different than my gumbo. And that's because your mama made her gumbo differently. Well, I grew up, gumbo didn't, wasn't gumbo unless there was okra in it. And um, that's, just, that's just the fact of nature. And then a lot of times, if you didn't have okra, you better have filet that you add into it at the last minute. And then if you're from New Orleans, you know, New Orleans always think of this, the, the Jesse tree of New Orleans cooking is, can be traced in its gumbo or the Jesse tree of Louisiana cooking can be tra traced in any one of these kind of like master recipes. And I highlight, you know, the gumbos and the dobes and the etouffees and the bisques and, um, and the jambalayas. There's all these different variations of them just like gumbo, but that one common thread is gumbo. Kind of like the common thread between the guy that just lost his house and I'm feeding out of the flat boat. That one common thread was red beans and rice. Or at the very least, it was food. And no matter where I've been around this world, whether it was in combat or whether it was just after Katrina, that common thread was um, very clearly food. And that um, we've all come across people from different cultures. And the one thing that we can relate to is 
hey, well, how do you cook this? Or how, what do you like to eat? And somehow conversation always comes down to that. Um, getting back to the gumbo, I think it's one, one thing that's really interesting is um, the gumbo's had this way of evolving over the years. And um, every, pretty much every culture that came to New Orleans or that came to Louisiana, but in particular New Orleans, because it's rich, you know, it's a little more cosmopolitan and full of so many more cultures than say other parts of the state. This, the, every culture would leave its little imprint on our gumbo through, um, through an ingredient. Maybe it's the andouille sausage from the Germans. Maybe the, uh, if it weren't for you know, a lot of the um, former Yugoslavians, the Croatians that came to Louisiana, we wouldn't have the oyster industry that we have today and so on and so forth. And you can kind of look and you see the, um, it, uh, the Swahili dialect for um, okra was gumbo. And gumbo made its way and um, just in many ways, like just, just like jambalaya. And these dishes really tell us who we are and tell us where we come from. And as a chef, really dictate where I'm going. Um, I think some of these are too sacred. And what I, what I mean by that is, after writing about food and this and that and developing recipes and thinking, oh, I'm so great, it really hit me that I'm nothing. Because if it wasn't for the city, if it wasn't for um, me being a chef in New Orleans, nobody would know who John Besh was and nobody would really care. And I'm okay with that because it's a beautiful place to be when I can, um, when I can act as a steward and where I can take something really rich and pass it on so many of the um, people working for me have never um, experienced something like this. They come from other parts of the country, and then they fall in love with what it is that many of us have just taken for granted our whole lives. And so I, as writing this book, okay, then I, I got away from my Louisiana, I got away from me, period, and started focusing more on New Orleans. And so then I thought, well, I'll create this around the childhood months of my year. And you see, for centuries we've been cooking here in this state without any regard for glossy magazines or Food Network or this and that. We were cooking with the seasons. Nobody had to tell us that. My granddaddy had his, you know, had his farm and my other grandfather had a, had a big, um, had an orchard in his backyard for that matter. We had pears and we had muscadines and scuffinades and we had all these different things that would find their way onto the family table, whether it was jelly or whether it was a roast. And and so I started thinking about my childhood seasons. And I remember about this time of year, you know, we'd just been through this hot summer. And then in my house, my dad made sure that we would all work. And six siblings, we had to work, 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 work. I was not the smartest and by far not. And so I had to work even harder. <laughs> and so my dad would have me, I would hold a job waiting tables or busing tables or washing dishes. And my granddaddy also had a job for me of working the garden and helping them put up all the different things that grew in the garden. And after this long, hot summer, about midsummer, you know, tomatoes have gone. The Creole tomatoes don't grow anymore past like midsummer. It's way too hot, way too humid. And then I'm just waiting for that first breath of cold air to come through. And that meant it was time to eat oysters again. Because you wouldn't eat oysters in the summer. And so then the oyster seasons come. So that needed to be a month. And that's like the, that would be like the, my, my favorite month like it starts to cool off it's time to, you know you know hunting season just around the corner and then comes hunting season after oyster season and hunting season meant going to the camp maybe going down the gate on maybe just uh hunting down in Lafitte or maybe it's just the honey island swamp right behind my house but hunting was definitely part of the equation and the hunting wasn't just because I wanted to go out there and kill something, but it was that relationship to food. Understanding where my food came from still influences me today in the way that I cook, in the way that I res try to res respect my food, in the way that I try to teach all of my cooks to respect the food. But not only that, it also meant gumbo season. That was a, that's when you started eating gumbo at this time of year, this kind of weather. I just had a, a beautiful chicken sausage gumbo out there today. And there's no better time. And the interesting thing as a young man coming up in this culture is that men cook. It's just not a woman's job, but it's a man's job to cook, you know, to, to get in there. And if you went to the hunting, uh, hunting camp, well, then 
every man thought they were more macho than the next, and each one had their own version on how to cook a gumbo and how to make a roux. Some would say a roux should take three long necks. Another would say a, a roux should take two stiff drinks. Um, my buddy Drew says it takes two sides of a scratchy LP. And you know, then I develop my idea. Every one of them thinking that they're right, and each one of them being very valid and very good. I happen to think that uh, I a little thing on Rue in there to, if you don't want to become an alcoholic and listen to poor music, then follow my directions. It's much easier. Um, then after that, we have Thanksgiving. And Thanksgiving, you know as well as I do, we eat the turkeys only to make ourselves feel like Americans. But it's all about the dressings. And um, then the whole thing about, you know, hey, all the different dressings and the different um, ways that my in-laws, the, the Berrigan family in New Orleans, celebrates their Thanksgiving. So kind of have a chapter on that. Right after Thanksgiving, then Revion begins. And the Revion holiday, you know, basically the whole Christmas season. And Christmas pretty much starts right around December 1st all the way until 12th night. And so we have our different Christmas traditions in there. And then 12th night, heck, it's time for Mardi Gras to start. And with Mardi Gras, there's another party. And the interesting thing is in New Orleans, in New Orleans, we have Mardi Gras for whoever, whatever shape, size, color, um, your economic background is, there's a Mardi Gras for you. As much as the rest of the country thinks you know, it has anything to do with Bourbon Street, uh, they're wrong, and most of us know that. Most of us know that it's a great family time. And to me, you know, there's nothing better than waking up early on Mardi Gras morning, and then you have a, you know, and you're, you're eating parade food. And you're taking, you know, you're frying chicken or you're having red beans and rice or jambalaya and all these things out at the parade route. And the interesting thing is you kind of look through this and in between, um, you know, just after then, that, you, then you have the holy days. And the holy days are, um, and for instance, the other day, or heck, not the other day, a couple of years ago, my son, who was six at the time, Brendan says, Daddy, I'm so proud of being Catholic. And I thought, Thank you, Lord. I've done something right in my life, and um, I should get good kudos for that. And I said, well, why is that, Brendan? I was expecting this, um, you know, something profound to come out of his mouth. And he says, because I can eat crawfish every Friday. <laughs> and it, you know what? It's hitting him, too. And the, it's continuing. The next generation, it, they're getting it, too, the same way that I got it. And it was the same way that my parents' generation learned about food. You learn about it through the family, through these traditions, and from your community. Then, um, so then you have like the holy season chapter. And then after that, you know, of course, you don't eat a strawberry unless it's from Ponchatoula, where I come from. And then at the same time, you have Ponchatoula strawberries, Johnny Becknell and Ben Becknell down, down the river. They have all their citrus in the season, too. And that's one funny thing about my kids is that They've never known like a, what a California navel orange is. They just know what satsumas are. And um, we kind of hide the, all the other imported citrus away from them. And they're good with that. And then after that, then you meander into the, the shrimp season. And then, you know, I never will forget. And you know, kind of got off on and started pontificating about shrimp in here. About, you know, I'll never forget that first time I went shrimping with Dad. And... I never will forget the time of like how I figured out I'm not cut out to be a shrimper, and that but I'm going to pay homage to those shrimpers. I'm going to buy all my shrimp from our Louisiana shrimpers because we need to perpetuate this culture. And so my year kind of goes through you know the speckled trout and redfish. You caught a redfish. What did mom do with it? Well, she made kubiom, and so redfish kubiom is a staple at my house. So when I have a menu, you know, we didn't have black in anything then. We didn't, uh, you know, this is what we did with redfish. And you had trout, you know, you had your trout manier, trout almondine, throw a little crab meat and, or some shrimp on top, and you have trout poncha train. But it's interesting that at a young age, I learned all this, but I didn't appreciate it. I didn't appreciate it until it was almost all taken from me. And now it's kind of culminated in this book. And so I changed the name from my Louisiana to my New Orleans. My New Orleans, not meaning this New Orleans that I'm the king of, but the New Orleans that I'm blessed to be from. And although I never, I've always considered myself a Slidellian, but I didn't realize that just growing up near New Orleans had a huge impact on the way we ate. And um, 
the way that my children still eat today. And so it's a, been a blessing to me to, to work on this. It took one full calendar year to um, photograph. And most publishers wouldn't be up for that sort of investment. But a full year to photograph, and I um, brought on a great friend of mine, Ditte Isgar from um, Denmark, who did a fabulous job photographing the book, using only natural light, of course, and a lot of people do that. But she used film, and the film really gave it this kind of starry, mystical quality to it that is truly, you know, through my eyes, that is what New Orleans looks like. It's a little romantic, and it's, it's, it's a little mysterious. And even still to this day, I'm driving into the city and smelling the diesel fumes and the coffee roasting and French bread baking. It smells like a city should smell, and I love that. And so she was able to capture a lot of the soul. About a third of the book are just stories of me pontificating on one subject or another, which you can see comes quite naturally. The, um, I, I believe that in order to cook our food with any sort of authenticity, you need to understand the stories behind it. You need to understand the culture behind it. And just looking at a recipe isn't enough. That, that ingredient that all of our grandmothers used was that little bit of love, that little bit of passion that just made things taste just a little bit better. And I think um, through understanding the stories and understanding how things are made or why things were made and why you eat things at a certain time of year and why they're seasoned like this and why certain ingredients are part of it, then you can better cook it with, um, with more passion and vigor. Louisiana Book Talks is produced in cooperation with the Center for the Book in the State Library of Louisiana and made possible in part by a grant from the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities. This is a program of Louisiana Public Broadcasting.